Welcome to Better Safe Than Sorry, everyone. I'm here today with Roman, who is a designer on the Firebase team, and we're here to talk about the UX of authentication and security. Welcome, Roman. Thanks for having me. So excited to be here and talk about one of my favorite subjects. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. So the reason why I invited you was this video here, Android Design in Action <laughs> from 2013. <laughs> Blast from the past. Yeah. So um, you had a chat with Adam Kosh, Nick Butcher, and it was about the onboarding experience. And you gave a couple of tips and tricks for how to do that in Android. And I wanted to basically review a couple of things that you talked about then and see what has changed since then. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this again. This is uh, one of those evergreen topics where it's, it's kind of hard not to talk about this in the field of UX. Yeah. So the first thing that you covered was zero state or empty state. And maybe we can talk about that and why it's important um, and how Firebase can help. For sure. So empty states or zero states are essentially when there's no content there, right? Mm -hmm. When usually you have, a, for example, a list of notes or something. Before the user has done anything, you got to show something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Most products tend to show some piece of information like, this is the worst. Like no results, nothing here. <laughs> yeah. You know, the next step up is to show a little bit of like, hey, get started by doing this, or mm -hmm. or some sort of you know communication to the user of what they can do. One of my favorite techniques, though, is to populate uh, the app with sample content. Mm -hmm. For a note taking app, a good example is you know if you can take text notes and photo notes and things like that, or drawing notes, you know, actually, why don't you just pre-populate it to showcase what the app can do, all the different features, and have the user actually interact with uh, real content to get a feel for what it is. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example in mind of uh, an app that does a good job at this? So forever ago, I actually haven't onboarded into Google Keep uh, recently, because I've been uh, using it for a very long time. Sure. <laughs> but back then, actually, we may have even mentioned it in the episode, but Google Keep did a really good job at this. They basically showcased all the different options, to-do lists, and large notes, and small notes, and different colors. And it really kind of made you instantly understand the value and the flexibility. So I thought it was a great example. Mm, yeah. And then I think for, for getting the data into the application, I mean, there are probably a couple of strategies that you can use. Um, I think most people will probably hard code the sample data right into the application. That's one way. But what's what would you recommend from the Firebase perspective? So so hard coding is a, is a simple way to do it. The the challenge there is you have to do it for every platform. Yeah. So if you're making an Android version, iOS version, you have to hard code it. Firestore data bundles, which is something that we released uh, somewhat recently, I think in the mm -hmm. last like two years or so, I'd say, um, is a great way to basically allow you to first, you know, actually use your app as a developer to make the content that you want, and then uh, snapshot it into a Firestore data bundle, bundle that with your actual app across different platforms, and then be able to essentially kind of unpack it into the into a user's account uh, once they decide to kind of get into the app and start using it. And you know that also also gives you that advantage of not having to pull this data and query the database for every single of your many million users that you hopefully have. Um, but you'll just have to do it at once, store the bundle somewhere on, um, you know, for, for example, Firebase hosting, and then download it from there and not have all those document reads. Now the users in the app. And one thing that I still see very many applications do is ask the user to sign in straight away. Um, and you know, I always, you know, I don't feel good about this. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you feel, but what's your recommendation for 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 apps? When should you ask your users to sign in? So I, I think a lot of this comes down to trust, mm -hmm. right? Um, some if you're a big brand where users already know who you are, they use you on different platforms. You know, it may be okay. Actually, you know, mm -hmm. to to ask the user to sign in a banking app, for example, right? You're likely yeah. not starting unless you're like a digital only bank or something. Um, you're likely not starting from the phone. Um, but if if the user has never heard of you, if if they just read an article and you were mentioned and they installed you, or they just heard about you from a friend, if the very first thing you do is ask the user to trust you with their Google sign in or or other information. That, that's kind of expecting a lot. And I think most folks will probably just uninstall and say, mm -hmm. you know, this may not be right for me. I'm mm. not, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about this. And so I think what's really important is to establish uh, trust. Sometimes it can come in the form of the user spending some time in your app. So if you see the user, you know, uh, coming back to your app, you know, every, let's say every, you know, uh, every day or so, or, you know, if they've been using the app for about, you know, 20 minutes, or, these are just random numbers out there. Mm -hmm. it, it's always going to vary. Um, if you get some signal that the user is invested now and they, it may be the right moment, then you can kind of, um, you know, suggest to them, hey, maybe you should sign in to store your information um, or sync across devices or things like that. Mm -hmm. But so much of it is going to come down to when the right moment is and establishing trust through some sort of signals that you're getting um, from the user. Yeah, that makes sense. But on the other hand, I mean, I guess one, one reason why a lot of um, apps out there say, OK, we need you to sign in the first thing is that they need some key that they can then use to, you know, identify the user and key the data to them. That is the main driver, or one of the main drivers for, for people doing that, right? Let's say you're building a cloud synced notes app. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things you may want to do, you probably don't want to ask the user to sign in right away. Right. Right. You you want them to make notes. They they downloaded you so that you can you know, so they can take notes. But if you're pitching yourself as a cloud sync note app, you probably want to think about, well, once the user decides to to sync, what am I going to do? How do I actually get all their notes into the cloud? And one of the best ways to do this is with anonymous auth, mm -hmm. with, with uh, Firebase. And so anonymous auth basically lets you start kind of uh, forming that user identity and start attaching real content to that without having the user actually sign in. But once they're ready to sign in, once they're ready to say, you know what, now I want to sync my information. Here's my Google account or my Facebook account, whatever it is. Um, then it, it becomes as easy as just attaching that that uh, federated login to that anonymous auth. Mm. And so um, anonymous auth um, is a real Firebase account, right? But you know it doesn't have any personally identifiable information attached to it. It's literally just the user's UUID. Right? That's right. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, and that is why you can use it for Firestore or for cloud storage and all of that. It's basically just this unique key that's unique across your entire application. Yeah, it's it's honestly when I first heard about this feature like years ago, it was just it blew my mind because the developer experience for for this it just made it so easy to to solve this onboarding problem mm -hmm. to not have to you know force people to sign in. Yeah. It's just it's a game changer. Yeah, I often think not many people know about this or not enough people know about this. So okay. hopefully after this episode uh, a lot more people will start using it. OK, so the user is an application. They've started using the application. They're um, um, using, well, you are using anonymous auth yep. to, um, to have this key. Um, for them, they don't really know that they're signed in because they're not really signed in. But you know, now you want to upgrade them. Let's talk um, about federated identity providers first. Um, so things like Google Sign-In or Sign-In with Apple, Facebook, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. What are some recommendations for using those federated identity providers? And how should you make this upgrade process? When's a good moment to tell the user, hey, you might want to sign in? You have to look at intent, right? Once the user decides to, to say that, hey, you know what, now I'm ready to sync. Um, now I'm ready to, you know, I'm committed. That could be a good moment. Um, one of the things that I think also to think about is, you know, how do you actually present the option, mm -hmm. right? I, th I think you have to think about which uh, which providers even offer, mm -hmm. right? I think this is it's uh, such an interesting problem because, you know, how uh, how people think about their identity has evolved over the years. You know, uh, folks probably have many different federated providers to that they work with, um, and. And I think you know one of the things you always want to be careful about is the uh, the NASCAR problem. What, what's, um, <laughs> what's what's the NASCAR problem? So it's essentially you know when when you have all the different options available to you for signing. Uh -huh. This is not actually this. Why is it called a NASCAR problem? Is if you ever watch you know a NASCAR race, uh, you'll see you know all the cars have. A billion sponsor logos oh, all over yeah, them. I see. Yeah. And it's just super overwhelming. It's oh, yeah. super overwhelming. One of the things to, to think about is, you know, what are the most popular uh, providers for your users? Mm -hmm. um, really understanding users is really important there to, mm. to understand where, uh, 
your, for your specific user base, which are the, uh, the most common, most popular providers? Mm -hmm. So would it be a good idea, for example, to say on Android, I'm going to use Google Sign-In, and on iOS, I'm using Sign-In with Apple? Yeah, that's a, that's a good baseline. That's actually likely a requirement. Actually, on the Apple side, I believe it's a requirement. I, I could be wrong. On Apple, if you use any federated identity provider, right. you also need to um, support Sign-In with Apple. It goes further than that. I think it's likely the you know, iOS users are going to expect that. Yep. Uh, Android users are going to expect Google sign-in. It's just yep. part of the expectations. I think that that's a really good baseline. Um, I would say you know, def start there, but also consider you know, if for different demographics, for different audiences, folks are going to be also really comfortable with Facebook sign-in or Twitter sign-in. For mm -hmm. developer products, GitHub sign-in. Mm -hmm. So uh, it really is going to depend. I think the, the most important thing is, understand the requirements in the platform and understand your user. Oh, and one thing that's probably also pretty um, a pretty good idea is if you are available on multiple platforms, support all the sign-in mechanisms on all of the platforms, right? I yep. mean, if I sign in using Google on an Android device, and then maybe I've got an Android phone, but uh, an iPad, mm -hmm. I want to sign in there. But uh, if the app doesn't provide Google sign-in on the iPad, <laughs> I'm lost. Right. That's such a good point. <laughs> That's a really good point because I could just only ima I can only imagine like hey I've signed in on you know on my Android phone with with Google and then it just doesn't even show up as an option or vice versa. Yeah. That would be really jarring. That's yeah. a really fast way to get a lot of customer support yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So federated identity providers, another um, sign-in mechanism I often see being used, and I'm you know I often think it's being overused is phone authentication. So you know I often think oh, people use it because they can, but I'm interested. What's your perspective? When would you recommend that people actually use phone authentication? I think it really comes down to two things. The, mm -hmm. the first is, again, going back to this is maybe uh, a broken record as a user experience professional. But um, the first thing is understanding your users. Mm -hmm. you know, I think depending on your users, where they're located, their region, what their cultural norms are, what the norms are in the country, um, their demographics. You know. Uh, you know, the you know, Gen Z folks are almost going to expect phones. Mm -hmm. um, other folks are not going to expect it. Um, I think that so much of it depends on what your users' expectations are and where they are in the spectrum of it. It must exist. I must be able to log in versus I actually do not want to log in with my phone. There's a wide array. Um, the second is about use case. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some uh, product use cases um, or some types of products where phone auth will not make sense. Can you imagine if, in the as part of logging into the Firebase console, we forced you to put in your phone number? Uh, it would be pretty <laughs> stupid, I think. <laughs> it would be so weird. But at yeah. the same time, if you're a ride, uh, ride sharing or food delivery app, the whole experience revolves around the phone. Mm -hmm. And so I think thinking about wh what does the phone actually mean as part of the broader experience of using the product, I think that is another key factor. So understand your users, what their expectations are, as well as understand or, or form an opinion on where the phone actually fits into the broader experience. Mm -hmm. One challenge that I've seen with phone authentication, and that's another reason why, personally, for me, I think you know it doesn't makes sense for many, many cases is that when you're um, moving from one country to another one, or even if you're staying in the same country and you're maybe changing your contract or you've got pay as you go, and then you, you switch to uh, a cheaper provider, for example, you get a new phone number. Um, and I always wonder, so you know, what, what happens there? Um, and, and oftentimes, you would lose access to the servers, and you would sign in using the new phone number, and then you'd have two accounts, right? The multiple accounts thing, that is always a challenge. Um, I think there's, there's two things to keep in mind. I think the first is never use something like a phone number or even an email address as a primary key, yeah. because those things change. They don't change often, mm -hmm. but when they do, they change catastrophically. Yeah, right? and, and you don't want to have your all the records in the database yeah. being keyed to your email address or to the phone number. That's right. Yeah. And so that, that's why one of the main reasons why you know, if, uh, Firebase authentication offers a, a unique or a custom UID, user yeah. ID. The second thing is, I think you know, make sure that it's there are flows to be able to change the you know change your phone number or change your email address. It all comes down to do not assume that this is permanent, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's hard. I will say it is hard. The very first time you get a customer support request saying what is happening, like that's the moment you'll learn. <laughs> but um, but it, it's uh, I think it's important to just keep those assumptions in check. The final point that I want to touch on is email 
and password authentication. Just in the previous episode, I sat down with Rachel and I showed her an application that I was working on and I implemented a beautiful sign-in screen um, and it had email and password authentication. I was super proud because it looked beautiful and then she told me off for using email and password authentication and she said, you know, it's um, passwords are the worst. Um, and I was like, but it's so easy to implement. And then she went down all of those things. Hey, have you thought about this and that mm -hmm. and verifying the email address that actually exists and all of that. But from a UX perspective, what do you think about email and password and what's important to keep in mind? It, it's funny, you know, if you look 25, 30 years ago, what were passwords? They were one six letter word uh, that you can easily <laughs> guess, right? Yeah. And because it was memorable, right? And so there, there is a lot of value. There's still cases today where, especially if it's not the most, you know, uh, important to fully secure thing, you know, if you really need to be able to remember something, if the user needs to remember something, they won't have easy access to password manager. There are limited cases, very limited cases where that's still okay. Um, but we've we have come really far actually as well with things like you know suggested passwords for Chrome mm -hmm. um, and, and across you know Android and so on. We've come really far to make passwords just about as good as they can be. Um, but even so, even the most uh, long and wild passwords, they're still going to need that second factor of protection. Mm -hmm. And so, and to Rachel's point, like there are lots of different things you need to consider when you're rolling your own email password based uh, system. Things to keep in mind, you know, are there ways to, you know, first not necessarily require federated login, but still use the user's email address mm -hmm. as the key. And one of the things I love is the uh, kind of the passwordless uh, one-time email links that that you can do as an alternative to actually requiring the user to, to store passwords. Um, there are a lot of great ca uh, use cases for when that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, when you know, if it, especially if it's been a long time, if it's not really frequent usage, uh, if it's been a long time since the user you know logged in, they may not even have stored that password. Yeah. So just offering, hey, just you know, uh, click this link. We'll we'll email you and click it to log in. That is a really nice workflow for a lot of cases. It feels like magic, right? You click on the link, you get the email, you you tap on it, and boom, you're in the application. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I often think you know that flow might have been invented because so many people click on I forgot my password, <laughs> right? And instead of sending the you know reset your password. We're now sending the link. Hey, click on this link, and you're signed in. It's a good. It, it almost feels like forgot password by default. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. So nice to talk about all those things, um, and you know, see what's changed, what's stayed the same in those past couple of years. And I look forward to having this conversation again in a couple of years, and see <laughs> how far we've gotten um, in the meantime. Yeah, I'm hoping it's not a couple of years. I'm hoping uh, to be on camera a little bit more. This is awesome. I, I miss this. This is cool. Um, but yeah, this is uh, onboarding and, and authentication in general is such a topic that is near and dear to my heart. As somebody that worked on onboarding for Firebase, um, I think it's so critical to get right. And like I said in the beginning, it's really an evergreen topic in UX. So mm -hmm. um, I look forward to coming back. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. And that was another episode of Better Safe Than Sorry, the show where we teach you how to build secure and safe applications using Firebase authentication. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next one. <laughs>